At this time, I'm going to invite you, if you have your Westover app, to open it. And we're going to look to God's Word. And I have something in my heart that I want to share with us this weekend. I want to talk to us about being fearless. In fact, I would call this fearless faith in a limitless God. We serve a limitless God, and I'm going to call all of us to just affirm our faith and our confidence in the Lord this weekend. The pandemic of the, what's called COVID-19 has really brought us into an unprecedented moment that we've never really experienced before. The whole world right now is talking about this pandemic. But for just a moment, let me just reflect on it. Infectious diseases have always been a part of human history. In fact, it was Louis Pasteur in the mid nineteen, uh, excuse me, the, the mid eighteen hundreds. He was the f- one that first began to talk about the idea of germs and disease and the connection they might have. But really, we go all the way back to the Bible, and the things that Louis Pasteur discovered were really in Scripture all the time. Such as in the Bible, in Leviticus chapter fifteen, we have the uh, experience of washing your hands over running water in order to be purified, in order to eliminate germs. There was in the Old Testament the practice of, of quarantining uh, people such as lepers that might have infectious disease and other people. And in fact, the Bible even tells us that if somebody was to ever get saliva on you, you were to wash your clothes and separate yourself from others for a period of time. Again, in Leviticus chapter number 15, the Bible tells us if there was uh, ever a time that you would, a person would have a discharge, that means if they, they were coughing, sneezing, saliva, etc., they were to separate themselves, and if they were sick for a period of seven days, they were to be separated until it was known that they were in good health. Well, right now we're in all the conversation about uh, the coronavirus, and, and right now I'm sure you're, with, you're along with me. I, I, I'm afraid to even uh, casually sneeze or even clear my throat. I've been baptizing my hand with sanitizer because we're just all kind of sensitive about this moment. But the Bible has something to say to us. The Bible has something to teach us, and I want to talk to us about this uh, having a fearless faith in a limitless God. Without doubt, without doubt, Fear is one of the most uh, troubling emotions and, and most common emotions that people have. And it seems to come to everyone. And when fear comes into our life, it, it somehow just overcomes every other experience we have. We start thinking about financial problems or it might come from an uh, uh, illness or a sickness, overwhelming family issues, uncertainty in our life in an, uh, in an area. And then all of a sudden, it seems like when we need faith the most, fear rushes in. Child uh, development researchers tell us that there are two fears that are innate in every human being. That's the fear of loud noises babies have and the fear of falling. Every other fear somebody has is a learned fear. The fear of, of water being alone, the fear of rejection, the fear of bugs, the fear, fear of any other kind of fear we have. We've learned that fear in some way. And do you know that fear attracts fear? That's right. You, you, you begin to be afraid of something, you'll say, you'll talk about it to your family members and say, well, you know what, you also ought to be concerned about. Fear seems to attract fear, and uncertainty somehow just compounds the fears that we experience in life. And all of a sudden, our worries can't see past our fears because fears kind of arrest our emotions. When you have an impending diagnosis and you're getting, going to get the biopsy or the lab results in, or the doctor just suggests in a conversation that, that C word. Or, or perhaps there's the whisper in the workplace about downsizing. Any mention of an emotion that somehow comes up and we begin to worry and be concerned and our fears come in. If we, we hear our air conditioning at the home making a noise, we think, oh, it's going to go out. Uh, we, we take our car and we just know It needs a new transmission. It may only need a spark plug. But our fears kind of just stoke that and make it worse. And the worst thing you can do is 
is Google symptoms. Have you ever done that, just Google symptoms? I, I Google symptoms one time and found out I have six of the ten symptoms of menopause. I tell you, you can just begin to search that, and all of a sudden your fears and your worries will just kind of overcome. Fears cause us to overestimate the bad news and tend to cause us to underestimate the good news. There's something about when it gets into our fears, it just overcomes our conversation. It was Mark Twain that said, as an old man, he said, I've had many great troubles in life, and most of them never really came about. In other words, he was saying it was his fears. Fears will sound an alarm in your emotion. And I will tell you, many of us, fears are talking to us right now, and fear will always tell you a lie. Fear will tell you it's worse, it's bad, it's incurable, you're going to go under, the business is going to go under, it's not going to work out. Fears will always exaggerate the bad news, but faith calls us to believe the good news about God and what He wants to do in our life. I want to encourage us, soar in faith and don't sink in fear. Soar in your faith. And don't allow yourself to sink in fear. Don't put faith in your fears. And we can do this so easy. I'm afraid it's not going to work out. That that, that business seminar I was going to go to is not going to be on. So our sales will go down. I'm, I'm sure that I'll get sick. And I'll probably be the sickest person on the block. I'll probably be audited by the IRS this year. My insurance will be denied. I'll be overlooked by my friends. All of a sudden we can begin to have faith in our fears. We can say, it'll be the worst. I know with my luck, here's the way it always happens. I want to encourage us. Don't sink in fear, but soar in faith. If you allow it, if I allow it, fear will dig a grave for our faith and our hopes. And then all of a sudden they'll be gone. Faith sees the troubles The challenges as manageable. They're never a crisis with faith. Faith always sees the opportunity. And I want to encourage encourage us. Let's be be faith-filled and not fearful. Let's be full of faith and not full of our fears. Block all the All the junk mail of fear coming in and the whispers and the news and the reports and the this and that and let it be exaggerated in your heart. Why don't you just unsubscribe to fear right now? Just block it off. For you see, fears will just drain our faith. Someone has said, doubt sees the obstacle, but faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. But faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. While faith soars on high, doubt asks, who believes? But faith answers, I. I want to encourage us to soar in faith in this moment, in this hour. In the Old Testament, somebody we've heard of, King David. There's a moment in King David's life in which he was between enemies. The Bible tells us that Saul was looking for him. He was threatened and insecure. So Saul was looking to to hunt David down, and, and, and Saul was wanting to kill David. I mean, that would make us fearful. Also, he found himself one day in the camp of the king of Gath. Just to remind you, Goliath was from Gath, and David had just slain Goliath. So now he's in the city, the camp of the enemy he had just killed, Goliath, and he was fearful. And the Bible says that in his fear, in his fear, he began to just pretend like he was insane so no one would hurt him. Later on, he was reflecting on this moment. And David wrote a psalm, Psalm 34, in reflection of that moment. And verse number four, this is what David said. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. I like that. 
And as it were, David was reflecting in, in retrospect. I, I should have sought the Lord is really what he was. I should have sought the Lord. But at that moment, he gave in to his fears. But he reflected later and said, I'm not going to do that anymore. And he would write a song and say, from now on, when, when I'm facing my fears, I'm going to seek God, and I'm not going to succumb to my fears. God did not choose us because we were high, and God's not going to abandon us because we're low. God's not going to walk out on us because we're going through a challenge. God's not going to step out of the way and let us just struggle and wallow in experiences in fear and difficulties. God is anxious to step into our life. You see, faith accesses God's benefits and God's blessings in our life. Faith gives us access to God's blessings and God's benefits in our life. Faith is the password that takes us into the goodness, the provision, the blessing, the healing, and the grace of God. Faith is the key to access all that God wants to do for us. It was Jesus in Mark chapter number 9 in which he was said, everything is possible if you have faith. Everything is possible if you believe. He didn't say if you just want to believe or you feel like believing or you can conjure up. He says everything is possible if you can just have faith. I like what the message version renders that. It says there, there are no ifs among believers. Anything can happen. I like that. There are no ifs among believers. And some of us right now, we're saying, well, if it doesn't last too long or if it doesn't get too bad, or if it doesn't, there are no ifs among believers. God will see us through. The opposite of fear is faith. God said in his word, Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith gives us access to God's blessings and God's benefits. Faith ushers us in. Faith gives you access. Relationship grants you authority. Let me explain. Everything we have from God, we have by faith. Salvation is by faith. We pray the prayer of faith. We walk by faith. We live by faith. Faith gives us access. Relationship grants us authority. I can remember when my daughters were at home and we were raising them. Oh, they, they, have, they have access to anything in the house. They have access to the refrigerator. They have access to every room in the house. But relationship is what gives them authority. When one of my daughters would approach me and say, Dad, can I borrow the car? Dad, I, I just want to go be with my friends. Can I, can I use the car to go here? Now, at that point, it was relationship that I would turn over the car keys to them. They, it was the fact that they were my daughter. If somebody had just walked up to the house and knocked on the door, can I have your car keys? No. Why? There's no relationship there. If somebody said, you know what, I, uh, I like you. I, I like your house. I like your car. I will bring it back. In fact, if you'll give me your car, somebody I've never met, if you'll give me your car, I'll bring it back full. Absolutely, I'm not going to do that. Why did I give my car keys to my daughter, let her drive it? Even when the vehicle would come out, it wouldn't be full. She wouldn't put gas in it. It was relationship. Here's what I want you to know. You know the Lord. You know the Lord. Faith has given you access, but relationship gives you authority. The authority to claim God's best, to claim God's healing, to claim God's goodness in your life, to claim God's goodness over your business, to claim God's protection for the community, to claim God's best for your family and your extended family. Jesus gives us that ability. We have authority through Jesus. And right now there are some of us, you are overburdened and underblessed. You are overburdened and underblessed. When all of this came up with the, the virus and the concerns, you felt like, I just can't do it anymore. 
It just seemed to stack up on top of everything else that you think is going wrong in your life. You're overburdened and you're underblessed. I'm going to invite you right now because you know Jesus to claim the blessing and the goodness of God in your life. This is what God says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse number 8. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. Good news. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. If we just knew the power of faith, we would never allow ourselves to be controlled by doubts or controlled by fears. In Romans chapter number 4, verses 18 through 21, I'm just going to kind of skim by these verses. But it talks about Abraham. He's called the father of the faithful. It says that in verse number 18 that, that Abraham, he hoped against all hope. Some of you are saying that. There's no hope left. Here, here's, here was the Bible says. Abraham, he hoped again. When there was no hope, he still had hope. He just hung on to God. Abraham hoped and believed. It continues, without weakening in his faith. Without weakening. That tells me faith can be weak. Don't get weak in your faith. The Bible says, and he faced the fact. Facts can say one thing, but his faith was saying something else. Is that you? Is, is your heart, is your faith saying one thing, but your bank account is saying something else? Is, is your heart saying one thing with God and, and your mind saying something else? Are you torn between the two? That's Abraham, and he faced the fact, yet he did not waver in unbelief. Regarding the promises of God, he was strengthened in his faith, gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. And I want to give that to you. Westover, I want to give that to you. God has the power to do what he has promised in your life and for your family. Never consult your fears to determine your future. Don't look to your fears to decide your future. Don't say, oh, no, we're going to miss work and business will be down. That seminar I can't go to, I, I won't be able to do this. I, the, the Dow is down. The S&P is down. I won't be able to retire like I planned to. The, we're going to be able to have to put off our vacation. We won't be able to do this. I, I'm sure this won't work out. Don't consult your fears. Look to God in faith. Believe that God is able to do what he has promised in your life. You see, God wants you and I to, walk, walk, to know that he'll walk with us, that he's going to lead us, and that he's going to protect us. God's going to walk with you. He's going to lead you through this. And God's going to protect you. In Psalm 91, in Psalm 91, the Scripture records verse uh, 5 and 6 and then verse number 14. The Word of the Lord says, You will not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor for the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor for the plagues that destroy at midday. Pause a moment. Right there, he says, Night, day, and midday. You have 24-hour care with God. You and I have 24-hour care with God. God's going to be watching it when you can't watch it. God's on guard when you can't be. God's going to watch your kids, your family, your future, your retirement, your career, your business. God's going to take care of things and watch over things that you and I can't watch over. And then he goes on to say, verse number 14, the Lord does. Because, because you love him, the Lord says, I'm going to rescue him. I'm going to rescue you. And I'm going to protect you for you, as the Bible says, because he acknowledges my name. Because you acknowledge the name of the Lord. God's going to watch over you. I remember a time a few years back. My mother called me on the phone. And she said, she'd always 
answer the phone, Jim. She just right away. And I could tell by her voice, it was excited. It was fearful. She said, I went to the doctor, and, and, and I haven't had a, an examination in a mammogram in, in 10 years. And the doctor said that there was a mass, and I'm to go back and have another, an, a, another examination and, and, and cons, a consultation with the doctor. And, and I could hear the, the fear, and I, I, could, I could almost hear the tears in her voice. I said, Mom, we're going to pray. She said, pray. We prayed, we didn't talk to him, we just prayed. We, we, we called upon the Lord, we, we claimed it. We claimed what God said, because you love me, I will rescue you and protect you. For he acknowledges my name. We called upon the name of the Lord. My mother went in on a certain day to see a doctor. I was waiting to hear from her. Later on that day, she called me. She said, Jim, you're not going to believe this. I went to the doctor, walked in, and they did a, they did another mammogram, another uh, one right there on the spot. The doctor came in, asked me my name, went out, came in a couple more times, asked me my name to verify my identification. Came in and out two or three times and kept waiting. And finally, the doctor came in, and on that, that white light that's on the wall that they put the x-rays in, We, we took today, and that mass is gone. And I have verified the film is right. This is yours. I can't explain it, but whatever was there is now gone. That just reminds us that we don't have to fear. We have the privilege of calling on the name of the Lord. And I just believe that that's going to be a reoccurring theme. Believers all across the nation, west over, we're going to call upon the Lord like we've never done before. And God's not just going to provide through this time. We're going to see unusual things. We're going to open a door for an unusual season of God's benefits, His blessings, His healing, His grace, His miraculous power in our life. God is anxious to work in our life. A fearless faith and a limitless God. Psalm 118, the chapter. Interesting thing about the chapter in the Bible, Psalm 118. What's interesting about it is there are 594 chapters in the Bible before Psalm 118. There are 594 chapters in the Bible after Psalm 118. So literally, Psalm 118 is in the heart of the Bible. The shortest chapter in the Bible is the chapter right before Psalm 118. The longest chapter in the Bible is the chapter right after Psalm 118. But Psalm 118 is the literally the middle chapter in the Bible. And the middle of that chapter Verse number 8, this is what Scripture says. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. And as it were, here's what God is saying. At the heart of the Bible, at the very center of the Bible, God is saying it's better to trust in God than to put confidence in others. God says you can rely on me. God will never file for divorce. God will never step out. God will never renege his membership with you. God will not put you on hold. God will not suspend his benefits. God's not going to pull out. God's not going to walk away. God's not going to say later. God's not going to say you don't qualify. God's not going to say your program just was outdated. God's not going to say things are no longer working. God's not going to say he's downsizing. God's not going to say there's a budget constraint. We can't help you now. God doesn't, is not going to say you don't qualify. God is going to extend his heart, and we can trust God in the face of whatever comes our way. A fearless faith in a limitless God. I remember in Bible college, one of my professors would say, the Bible is the story 
over and over again, teaching us this lesson. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. And truly, that's true. That's right. When things in life, things in society, things in your home, things in our country and things around the world, when they can't find stability, can't find direction, when there's trouble and turmoil, man's extremity, when man doesn't know what to do, that's always God's opportunity. You see, God's in the business of always showing up. It was in the extremity of bondage that God said, I'm going to send to deliver. And Moses stepped out of the wilderness. It was the extremity of pressure there in Babylon that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were facing the consequence of a fiery furnace. And God said, I'm going to step in. It's the extremity over and over again where God just steps in human experience. And God does what we can't do. God comes through. And our confidence in our God is never shaken. To all of our senior citizens, let me plant a promise in your heart. Let me plant a promise in your heart. Psalm 103, verse number 5. It says, I will bless the Lord, O my soul who satisfies your desire and gives you good things. And your youth is renewed like the eagles. Yes. God's going to give you an immune system of a young athlete. God's going to stand by you. God's going to be with you. The promises of God override the problems of life. God's always on our side. And if our problems are too big, it means... Our experience with God is too small. And I invite you to experience the goodness and the faithfulness of God. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. I'm going to invite the Westover family to join me in a prayer just in a moment. Our friends that are watching, I'm going to invite you to join me in a prayer in just a moment. I'm going to invite you, if you're in a living room, to gather your family together, if you can, if that's convenient. If you're in a life group or a gathering of people, it may not be convenient to do that, but as much as possible, kind of surround. And we're going to go kind of gather around. We're going to have a prayer moment. What are we going to pray about? Well, we need to pray for our community and our governmental officials. The Bible instructs us to pray for them. We want to do that. We want to pray for our, our health care system, our health care providers and all of the first responders that are on the front line of this virus right now their families as well we want to pray for those who are inflicted with the virus or affected by the virus we want God's hand upon them we're going to pray that God's going to arrest this virus and quickly quickly turn it around that, that quickly there will be a vaccine in behalf of at your family, in behalf of our community, in behalf of the needy people in third world countries, we're going to pray to that end. And I also want to make mention, this Wednesday, this Wednesday on March the 18th, we're going to open up this auditorium from 7 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock in the evening. We're just going to have it open. You can come for a moment of prayer, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. The auditorium will be open, and you can come by here at Westover and pray. You don't have to be a member of the church to come and pray. We're just going to have it open for people to pray. And I want to extend that opportunity to you. Would you join me right now? And let's pray. You can bow your heads. We're going to pray and just look to the Lord. And Father, I lead the Westover family and our friends in praying for our community leaders. They need wisdom and direction in handling this. They're overwhelmed by the information and the, the data. And Lord, there's not resources in every area to reply to that. And their heart is to do the best for the community and the citizens. And I pray God You'll give them strategic wisdom to respond to this. 
I pray, God, for the health of the health care workers and the first responders and their families. They feel taxed right now. There's so much going on. Put your hand of care upon them. Watch over them. Bless them and favor them. For those who are infected and affected by this, I pray over them. Lord, that there'll be quick healing to the body. For businesses and community agencies and our our society and our function and what we do as a community. So many things have been impacted by this. I pray, God, that you'll just step in and give assurance and this will quickly pass. And I speak, oh, blessing into your people. And I pray, God, that you'll stir faith in their hearts. Stir faith in their hearts. Some, God, have just been overcome by by fear. That's the natural thing to do. But the spiritual thing to do and the godly thing to do is to call upon the name of the Lord. As David said in Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. For just a moment, let me just say as I close out, I want to thank the Westover family for your generosity. We have online giving and, of course, text to give. And this is a challenge we've never faced before. So I'm just going to invite you to step in with us and let's all do our part. And if you can, just do something special from the generosity of your heart for the Westover ministry and what we're doing here. You can communicate with us on the app, social media. You're welcome to email us. Whatever we can do to serve you, you're important to us, and we love you. Denise and I would like to extend our best to your family, to all of our friends, to anyone that's a part of the Westover community and the wonderful city that we live in, San Antonio. We say God bless you, and we love you.